Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Markets whipsaw as the BOJ adds flexibility to its yield curve control program. Governor Ueda says he doesn't see yields significantly beyond 1%. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rules out a ceasefire with Hamas and dismisses calls to resign. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas, to surrender to terrorism, to surrender to barbarism. That will not happen. And a spooky month for stocks comes to an end as the earnings season ramps up ahead of the Fed's decision tomorrow. The S&P 500 rebounds from a near technical correction. Good morning. The Bank of Japan is loosening its grip. The last time it did this was on the 28th of July. Are we seeing as pronounced moves as we did then? Yields are rising on the JGBs this morning. Ueda says they will react nimbly. What does that mean? If you no longer have a hard cap at 1% and you are prepared to act nimbly, where will the market test you? Ueda doesn't see yields rising significantly beyond 1%. What exactly does that mean? Keep an eye on Euro Yen. You've broken 160 for the first time since 2008. You've had a near quadrupling of rates in Japan in the space of a year. Dollar Yen, uh, this is the dollar moving higher, the yen moving lower. Again, markets will test the boundaries and the bandwidth of what nimbly really means from the Treasury. Uh, no longer having a hard cap on the yields really is going to be through the prism of FX that you're going to see more pressure. So you are just seeing this biggest drop in two months as that grip uh, is perhaps lessened a little bit by the Bank of Japan. Ten-year government bond yields, uh, it's interesting how the narrative in terms of the Treasury refunding uh, has moved. Let's see uh, what the state of play is in terms of issuance tomorrow. Uh, we've seen slightly less borrowing than perhaps the market had anticipated. But wow, Danny, it's a question of whether it's revolution or evolution at the Bank of Japan. Good morning. Good morning, Manis. I mean, those moves in the FX market are remarkable. But as those moves have been happening over the past 15 minutes, relief is coming to this equity market. Now, I'm not too sure what's driving this, Manis, but just 30 minutes ago, we were negative across the U.S. futures. Now we've turned around. S&P 500 futures on the highs of the morning, up one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ futures, which were decisively lower, are now little changed. We did fight back from the correction yesterday, the best day for U.S. stocks in two months. We did have a lot of analysts, though, decide to downgrade their year-end targets, Opco being one of them, John Stolfus over there, your Denny's firm also downgrading. So yesterday being a dead cat bounce on the eve of Halloween maybe is quite fitting. But again, sentiment seems to be shifting very quickly this morning as we head into the more liquid hours of the pre-market trade. European stocks, those are on the front foot too. Manus up nearly seven-tenths of one percent for Europe, despite BP earnings massively disappointing. Those shares have fallen as much as four percent today. It was their gas trading that missed. But Manus, we got to go back to the BOJ. The story of today, I think I've got that euro yen chart again, just because these moves are remarkable. If you thought the release was dovish, the presser was certainly dovish compared to what we thought it would be based on the Nikkei yesterday. Ueda saying that he didn't think yields would go above 1%, that they'll still buy below 1%. Is this as Kit Jukes put, puts it, Manis? that they haven't really changed anything but given themselves more flexibility. Is it them trying to have their cake and eat it too? Well, this raises uh, the, the, the game, doesn't it? Next year, they're saying inflation will be 2.8% up from 1.9% this year. So what they're doing is they're setting the stage for perhaps something much bigger to come. It's interesting. We saw some bigger moves uh, at the end of July when we saw the previous move than what we're seeing this morning. One standard deviation move. Yes, I find the one standard deviation move in dollar yen, <laughs> not euro yen. I know Tom and John and Lisa will be dealing with the pros a little bit later on. That's the move they look at. Um, let's dig a bit deeper into the Bank of Japan, Danny, shall we? They've loosened the grip around the government bond yields, uh, remaining the last of its peers to cling to negative interest rates. Governor Ueda uh, spoke after the decision. The Bank of Japan will not set strict upper limits or lower limits on long-term interest rates. Under our adjustment operations, we don't see yields rising significantly beyond 1%, even if upward pressure is placed on long-term interest rates. Let's get to Mark Dowding, CIO at RBC Blue Bay Asset Management. They will move nimbly. They doesn't, he does not see rates pushing much above 1%. Is that hope 
an aspiration or will the market challenge it? How quickly do we break through 1%? How much more momentum is there in dollar yen? Good morning. Good morning. So, so I think on, on JGBs, we, we are going to see yields continuing to push higher. Uh, I, I think the market will look to take on the 1% level and, and look to ultimately test uh, where the BOJ is prepared to step in and intervene. Um, but I think you have to remember that the reason that we're, we're seeing this move up in yields is the fact that um, Japan is, is seeing inflation running above target. We're seeing 4% in terms of core inflation in Japan uh, uh, just now. Uh, and it seems that um, on an ongoing basis, um, uh, the Japanese uh, BOJ inflation targets uh, are being rewritten and rewritten as they were today, mm. uh, quite substantively. Uh, and so the, the direction of uh, travel seems to be clear. The question is, uh, how, how quickly are we going to be testing those levels? Uh, and um, but, indeed, but Mark, what is going to be the we have we have a B, we, we have a BOJ in, in Ueda, if I can just jump in here, who has said they are happy to buy under one percent. So to kind of get back to Manis's question, I mean, how much higher can one percent do you think yields will really get again if you have the governor himself saying that they will yeah. buy before it gets to one percent? Yeah, well, I, I would suggest that uh, if, if you're looking at yields getting to 110, for example, then uh, ultimately you're looking at a point where um, uh, UADA is losing credibility. So there will be a level at which they will want to draw some sort of a line in the sand. I get a bit of a sense from UADA and the Bank of Japan that they're hoping that the uh, US Treasury market can bail them out. Um, obviously, uh, part of the problem that they've had over the course of the last month or so has been the move up in long-term U.S. yields has actually been putting pressure on, on the BOJ to, to act more swiftly than maybe it wants to. Um, but um, I think the, the reality here is were we to see another leg up in Treasury yields, uh, then I think that the, the BOJ would once again find itself in a very uncomfortable position. And if it is being forced to intervene to buy more bonds, effectively you're delivering more dovish monetary policy. This is going to undermine the yen. And you can see scenarios where sort of dollar yen is, is heading towards 160. Um, uh, and uh, investors uh, essentially concluding that uh, uh, BOJ policy is a model uh, and that uh, UAD is making a policy mistake. So there you go, Danny. You finally got the call of 160. So, Mark, let's, ju let's just, I mean, Danny and I are just talking to one another here. It sounds like, it sounds like this is pinning all their hopes, Danny's saying. What, what Danny, finish the sentence. They're pinning, yeah. Bank of Japan, pinning well, their it, hopes on a global bond market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark, what, what I'm hearing from you is that it sounds like they're pinning their hopes on, on no more global bond market sell-offs, which seems like a, a mistake. <laughs> I, I, I would say so. I mean, uh, it, it feels like all year the, the, the BOJ has had this view that actually the U.S. economy will slow down and they've been trying to make policy in Japan based on what they think about the U.S. economy. Mm. And they haven't spent enough time actually focusing on the domestic fundamentals. Inflation in Japan has, has moved materially and continues to move materially. And it, it will actually accelerate again in all likelihood at the start of the new year. So I feel that um, BOJ needs to be looking closer at home. Well, if you look at the ramifications, I mean, Mohamed el and a number of other people have talked about the pillars of stability within the bond market being removed. That's the U.S. bond market being removed. Here we are. One of the pillars of stability has been the fact that you have this ongoing yield differential between Japan and the United States of America. That has, to a certain extent, been partially removed. You're looking at Aussie rates spiking higher, U.K. rates spiking higher. What is the vacuum flow from from this change in Japan, can that momentum build? Will mm. there be further repercussions globally? Actually, if we look at it the other way around. Yeah, so I, I, I do think that if we saw uh, a very rapid move up in uh, JGB yields, then this clearly would have global ramifications. But I would emphasize the fact is that we've seen an enormous move up in Treasury yields, an enormous move up in Bund yields at a time where JGB yields have been relatively stable. Uh, and so saying that uh, uh, another 20 basis points move in JGBs as that pillar is eroded uh, will, will translate into a, a move which is 2x or 3x of that in, in global markets. It may be a simplistic way of actually looking at things. The honest truth is that actually these markets have not been particularly correlated. Uh, and okay. it's, it's quite conceivable we could see markets going in different uh, opposing directions next year. 
You know what this is all leading to, Manus? Trick or it's treat. the Halloween spooktacular. Spooktacular <laughs> Halloween. I think that's what Mark said in his note to us. Is that right, Manus? I mean, I got to hand it to Dowdy. You know, you managed to get it in there. You're going to have me down in Greenwich Village tonight all dressed up and spooked up. Uh, but you talk about heightened volatility. Well, where the marginal factors, and I'm fascinated to know here, the marginal factors can have a dramatic impact on asset prices. And in that respect, we're light, but we suspect there will be opportune moments or better valuation points for you to go in. How light on risk are you, and where do you want to see the opportunity to dive in? Is it a break of U.S. Treasuries at 5%? What is it that you see as an opportunity between now and Christmas? So, so I think that there are there are a number of uh, um, sort of troubling things that are going on in the world right now, and it, and it feels like to to us that there's a bit of a sense of complacency in markets. If you look at uh, equities, for example, you look at the the multiples we're trading at, notwithstanding the move up in long term discount rates uh, on future cash flows, notwithstanding the fact that we've got issues in the Middle East and everything like that, we wouldn't be surprised to see. Uh, investor sentiment tested at some point uh, and, and a deeper correction. So were we to see um, the S&P trade down uh, to 4,000 or below, were we to see credit spreads move wider, we'd like to be in a position where we can be buyers on any weakness. Uh, but um, what we're really cautioning against is complacency that we see in, in certain parts of the market. Mm. Uh, and uh, and for, from our point of view, it's actually been quite a tough year for a lot of investors. Um, and uh, uh, and when you have sort of a tough period like this, often you, you try and look for what the consensus trades are because often markets will go towards the pain trade. And so you ask yourself right. what the pain trade really is. Wait, Mark, sorry, we literally just have 30 seconds, but can you just put a bow on it? What, what is the pain trade? So I think, I think the pain trade here uh, would be uh, for um, uh, yields to continue to rise and, and for stocks to... Uh, to, to continue to fall. I think that that is the pain trade for now. Um, but uh, okay. if you do see that moment of capitulation, that's probably the one that you're, you're really looking for as, as a buying opportunity. All right. Capitulation watch. Mark, you're going to have to join us when it happens. Honestly, before it happens, just come back and join us maybe on a, on a less spooky day. Mark Dowding there of Blue Bay Asset Management. Thanks for your time. All right. Let's get you some other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. And uh, we're back to Halloween. It's scary fast event on the eve of Halloween. That's not me saying that. That is what Apple called their new rollout of a new iMac, MacBook Pros, and the third generation of its in-house Mac processor line. The new chip lineup boosts performance and graphics. The company's homegrown semiconductor business, known as Apple Silicon, has become a prized asset. X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, is worth less than half of what Elon Musk paid for it a year ago. Bloomberg has learned that restricted stock units awarded to employees value the company at $19 billion. A year ago, Musk bought Twitter for $44 billion, Danny. And shares of Stellantis are rising after the carmaker reported third quarter revenue that beat estimates. It confirmed its full year guidance in an update that analysts called strong. But Stellantis said prolonged strikes that curbed output at its North American facilities could cost the Jeep maker around $3.2 billion in revenue. Coming up on the show, we speak to Madison Foller of J.P. Morgan Private Bank to discuss the attractiveness of these opportunities for long-term investors. And Netanyahu rules out a ceasefire as Israel stepped up its ground operations in Gaza. We are live to Tel Aviv on Bloomberg. Tend to have resign is Hamas. We're going to resign them to the dustbin of history. That's my goal. That's my responsibility, and that's what I'm leading the country to do. That was the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dismissing the calls for him to resign, and really not a ceasefire with Hamas. Let's get to Tel Aviv. Oliver Crook is on the ground. <coughs> Oliver, fairly defiant, defiant Netanyahu. The latest on uh, the operation, ground operations. Good morning. 
That's right, Manis. As things intensify in the ground operation, we really have to pay closer and closer attention to those daily briefings we get from the Israeli Defense Forces. And so we've been watching that this morning. What we understand is that they have expanded yet further their operation on the ground in Gaza. They say they're going to continue to raid the areas. They are not giving a huge amount of detail on the mechanics, but they say that they're continuing uh, to do that and that they're going to focus their activity really on the north. This is why they'd asked so many people to evacuate. They say 800,000 people have left the area, which still leaves um, quite a few, but they say that that is a positive development. That as we have more than 8,000 dead in Gaza, according to the health authorities there. The other few things that we're watching about are aid. The Israelis have said that aid will increase substantially this week, either today or tomorrow, potentially getting to that 100 trucks a day, which is what the UN and other aid agencies are necessary to get any kind of substantial relief in. Only 26 yesterday, so really until we see those cross. And then the question of um, hostages, we, they understand that they recovered one Israeli soldier. She is back home. She is uh, in good condition and apparently had some intelligence for them in terms of the operations within Gaza. Oliver, one thing that, that stuck out to all of us in, in the most recent 24 hours is the U.N. warning that in Syria it's the most dangerous it's, it's been for a long time. What is happening in, in the region of a whole with this increase of unrest we've seen? I mean, Danny, you know, take your pick. I mean, Syria, you have Israel still striking in there, returning fire from uh, from operations that are happening within there. The U.S. has also um, targeted uh, at least two targets within Syria, so that's one of the points. But another story out overnight from Bloomberg reporting um, something that actually happened last week, but that Saudi forces are on high alert after there was a, a, um, a, a some fighting in the southwest of Saudi Arabia with Houthi rebels that killed four uh, Saudi soldiers. So this is all, you know, these are many of the flash points. You still have fighting going on in Lebanon. And of course, something that we need to watch also very closely is the West Bank. Um, from Sunday to Monday, there were six Palestinians killed by, by Israeli forces. This is all part of the mix in terms of where the sparks could come in the next level of this war. Yeah, and there's a number of warnings uh, from the British government in terms of traveling to some of the countries in the Middle East. But that, that high alert for Saudi mm -hmm. is particularly prescient. Um, Netanyahu, uh, in terms of the other issues that he addressed last night, his political future, uh, he was very firm on on that. What else stood out for you? Yeah, so he was really a prime minister, it felt, on the defensive. It was a press conference that he gave in English. There were a lot of foreign journalists who managed to put questions forward. And defensive on two fronts. On the first front, which is basically Israel's actions in Gaza. He was really trying to send the message that he has throughout this, that there's a difference between the way that Hamas attacked Israel and the way that Israel is, though killing civilians, doing so as sort of incidentally. This is something, again, as you have 8,000 people dead, that may not be resounding terribly with the full global audience. But the second front that he is defensive on, he was asked last night by a journalist, you are losing confidence of the Israeli people. Will you resign? Will you step down? He said, no, absolutely not. The only thing I want to resign, as we heard him say earlier, um, is Hamas to the dustbin of history. But really, this is the question uh, for, for many of us and for many people who are watching Netanyahu as the pressure rises, particularly after those posts over the weekend where he was really blaming the Israeli defense uh, system, which were really taken very poorly in uh, Israel. Oliver, it's been almost a week, not quite, but almost a week that the U.S. has actually had a Speaker of the House with Johnson in charge. Mm. Where do we stand on American aid to Israel? So really, this is going to complicate a little bit, as it seems. What Biden had tried to do, as we recall, after he came to Israel, he w gave that sort of Oval Office address, and he said that we need to deal with a lot of different uh, crises at once. And he rolled them all together to this request in Congress for more than 100 billion dollars. Now, what the GOP is wanting to do with its new leadership is to disentangle all of these parts because they don't want to support in the same hand Ukraine and Israel. So the GOP is willing to put forward this bill for 14.3 billion dollars for Israel, which is key funding for the for for Israel and is very closely watched here. Okay. But again, it makes it more complicated now because it completely changes the dynamic of what the Biden administration was trying to get through. Oliver, thank you very much. Oliver Cook in Tel Aviv with the very latest headlines right here on Bloomberg from New York, London and Tel Aviv.
This is Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York. Now to a story that caught our eye and is one of the most read stories on the terminal this morning. Manus, Morgan Stanley's decision to award its new CEO, Ted Pick, and two of the top competitors for the CEO role, $20 million worth of bonuses each. It started to raise some questions over governance for Wells Fargo analyst Mike Mayo. Mayo saying that it shows the bank is, quote, paying top execs to stay, which raises a question about whether, Manus, they are staying due to comp more than culture. Well, if somebody offered me 20 million bucks to tell you I'd go to pretty much any part of the world, <laughs> work as a reporter on the side of the street, pretty much. But Same problem. If, if you go back, if you go back to what Mayo wrote uh, just, just a couple of days ago. Um, if this is managed well, in other words, the retention, if this is managed well, the potential is to become a textbook transition, a telegraph transition mm. with a known executive and top managers staying on. Well, wouldn't you stay on if somebody gave you $20 million? I mean, I, I, I mean, your scruples about not getting the top job, I suppose it's ego versus dollars, isn't it? I mean, give me 20 million, Manus, and I will conform to whatever culture at whatever firm you want me to. Maybe some exceptions, but not many. Um, but you're right. Alison Williams of Bloomberg Intelligence says the same thing. One of the key risks is whether Saperstein and Simkowitz stay on. Is 20 million enough? to get them to stay on Manus. Well, keeping them is part of the succession story. There you go. You've just told the bosses now that you'll go anywhere <laughs> for money. That is, that, that is where you are, but you're going to come and stay. You're going to uh, come to New York with me, aren't you? Yeah. Tell the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Absolutely. And I hope a nice 20 million is, is waiting for me <laughs> on the way out, Manus. <laughs> More on the markets in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manus Cranny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what you need to know. Markets whipsaw as the BOJ adds flexibility to its yield curve control program. Governor Uwidiot says he doesn't see yields rising significantly beyond 1%. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu roll, rules out a ceasefire with Hamas and dismisses calls to resign over security failures in the October 7th attack. And a spooky month for stocks comes to an end. Earnings season ramps up ahead of the Fed's decision tomorrow. The S&P 500 rebounded from near technical correction levels. But let me tell you, we are getting whipsawed in this future session today. I started out the show 30 minutes ago saying, wow, a bid is in for this equity market. It's pretty much disappeared. For U.S. futures, we are flat for the S&P. Yes, it clawed its way out of a correction yesterday, but it's really failing to hold on to that momentum. Tech stocks getting hit especially hard today. NASDAQ futures down uh, about a quarter of 1%. It could be this Wall Street Journal story on NVIDIA missing out on about $5 billion worth of sales to China due to AI curbs. It could be some of the weak China data we have. It could be just this nervousness in this market we have over a, shall we say, confusing BOJ decision. European equities, those are up about four tenths of one percent. Some poor earnings from BP, those are making the shares fall today. Some weakness with their gas and tradings business. But again, man, it's the only way you can really characterize this morning's market is confusion and skittishness. Yeah, well, you're not exactly the voice of joy in that market, are you? I mean, if, if you could find, <laughs> find a good news story, give it to Danny. She just broke the bid in the equity markets. One thing for sure <laughs> is, that, is that the Japanese are losing their grip, a vice like grip around yield curve control. What does it mean? They will move nimbly. We've just had Mark Dardine saying uh, the test for this market is to take it to 1%. So they are going to move nimbly. We'll, yield curve control, no longer a hard cap at 1%. They will move to adjust it. They will move nimbly. Dardine from Blue Bay says not only will they test the 1%, but if it gets to 1.1%, Ueda will have lost control. That takes us to dollar yen. What happens next? Perhaps the, the bigger volatility trade and the bigger capacity to move is in the FX. It's an unbridled market. It's a less dirty market, so to speak. Yes, there's intervention in it. It could get to 160. Martin Malone at Oral says this is a pretty much blowing off of yield curve control. Of course, he was with us and he said dollar yen gets to 200. Dardine says 160 is eminently possible uh, on dollar yen. Ueda says that they will patiently continue with easing. For now, the markets are not convinced dollar yen is testing the metal. Let's see where the Ministry of Finance becomes so irked. Keep an eye on U.S. Treasuries because, of course, we got the news yesterday that they've cut their borrowing target to $776 billion. That is still a record. 
That is still a record. And you're on course for a two trillion deficit by 2025. So the heat has not gone completely uh, from this US Treasury market, which the Japanese are hoping will do the dirty work for them and camp yields. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. Yeah, that's what Mark Dowding from Blue Bay said, right, that they're kind of pinning their hopes on not having a global bond market sell off. That's kind of a scary prospect, given what this bond market is doing. And, and he gave us some potential levels for Japanese assets should something like that happen. Yep, as I said, 160 on dollar yen and, and 110 on JGBs would be the real point of contention with UADA. Yeah, but if it goes above one by too much, one percent by too much, Mark Dowding says that threatens uh, really the reputation and credibility of UADA. And Manus, to that point, I know you've just showed this. Let's just bring it up so everybody can see it, what the board looks like for Japanese assets. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you just did such a good job walking us through it. There you go. 150 Nikkei stocks are rallying. But again, that 10-year yield up about five and a half basis points. But what does this mean for the global world of bonds. Joining us now is Madison Fowler, global investment strategist at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Madison, again, just approach this from a global lens. Does today's BOJ decision, more flexibility, maybe more confusion for the markets, does it change anything for your treasuries? Sure. Thank you for having me. You know, I think there's a there's a little bit of that for sure. I think to, to some extent you're seeing one of those final remaining anchor points for global bond yields start to come loose. We saw some of that really start to happen over the summer, which I think contributed to that rise in term premium that we saw in treasuries, um, certainly contributing to that surge higher. But I do think that that needs to be taken in tandem with how high treasury yields already are. And certainly one thing that policymakers and Fed Chair Powell has really made sure to, I think, tell Telegraph is that with rates at such high levels, that ultimately goes to, I think, add to the restrictiveness of rates and that tightening in, in, in financial conditions. And so I do think that you have to kind of weigh those two balances um, together. Madison, good to see you this morning. You say we're in a pocket of discomfort. Will there be more of an uncomfortable, uh, bumpy ride in the bond market? In other words, testing and blowing through the 5% level perhaps relative to the equity market, which has already had a technical correction in SPOOs and a correction in NASDAQ. Sure. I think it's, it's very possible we see some further spikes in, in bond yields from here. We have a flurry of data coming our way over the course of this week. We have the Treasury refund, refunding announcement um, coming on Wednesday to give us a sense for how the, the Treasury will be looking at the maturity of, it, of, of that debt. Um, we also have the, the Federal Reserve meeting, how they're signaling higher for longer. Um, and we have a slew of jobs market data. So I think that there certainly are still some points that could signal to us, you know, do we have, you know, stronger growth? growth, mm -hmm. what does term premium look like? So I do think that you could see some spikes from here. But again, to bring it back to the fact that higher bond yields do act to, you know, ultimately slow economic momentum, we do think that the path lower for interest rates um, is ultimately lower over the course of the next 12 months. Can you trade that yet? I, I, I totally get the idea that on the long term horizon, this makes sense. But it is such a skittish market. It's, it's, it's a difficult bond market. Even equities up more than 1% one day, falling into a correction the next day. Is it too soon to position yourself that way? Or do we need to wait till next year to see if that's actually how it plays out? I think we can take it in steps. And I think one of the first things to do is, is to step out of cash. And so we think that cash ultimately has, it's, it's worked over the course of the last year as central banks hiked quite aggressively. But now we're confronting reinvestment risk um, as central banks go on hold, start to talk about, you know, when those cuts might eventually come into play. And so I do think taking that first step out is important. When it comes to fixed income, I think you can take a little bit more of a barbell approach. You can take a little bit of credit and duration risk, um, so staying shorter duration um, from maybe one pocket of your, your fixed income exposure. But then at the same time, we know that after um, the final Fed rate hike over the last seven hiking cycles, 10-year Treasury yields tend to fall 100 basis points over the course of the next year. So some longer duration fixed income also probably makes sense. Mm. I think the difficulty is, is, is whether the data, if the Fed is truly data dependent, they may have no alternative but to go for a, another hike. We're looking around some of the other big house analyst notes, and some people are saying earnings, projected earnings forward into 2024, a little bit too rich, a little bit unrealistic. Um, and absent of real rate cuts, it's just too hopeful. Do you think valuations are too rich? Do you think forward PEs are just a little bit too rich looking into 2024? 
I think we've seen a, a, a lot of um, correction already in valuations. Um, when we look at S&P 500 Ford P.E. ratios, um, you are looking you know, pretty much back in line with long-term averages. Um, so I think for, for the path for valuations, I think, really relies on some stability in bond yields. Um, I think it's also important to you know, think about why bond yields are rising. And to an extent, if that's due to better growth, I think that's something that equity markets can handle. But I think what's really more important for, for us is that earnings backdrop. You're seeing some skittishness around this earnings season, I think, as management starts to talk about, you know, what future quarters might look like. But I really wouldn't miss the force for the trees. This actually looks to be the first quarter of earnings growth after three straight quarters of contraction. And I think as the market, you know, moves past these, these catalysts and gets more clarity that the Fed is indeed done, done hiking, I think that allows for earnings growth to power through um, and for stock markets to, to rally forward. But again, that's not to say there won't be some volatility along the way. I mean, to that point, investors have just been punishing any company that slightly misses. We saw that in big tech. What do you just make of the sentiment shift we've seen this earnings season? Yeah, I think it's been really interesting. Um, to that point, of the companies that have reported, 60% of them have had a negative price reaction. Um, and I think that has to do less with the earnings results themselves, but again, more so what um, management has been you know, forecasting for future quarters. You know, are they seeing, I think, more macro headwinds, and what does that mean um, on a go-forward basis? Um, but again, I, I would just telegraph that these are quite solid reports, and I think once we move past this, this quarter, I think it's more of a transition quarter, um, I think it starts to look more promising. Mm. Madison, let's just square off. We've had uh, services in China come back uh, less than we estimated, manufacturing solidly in contraction. Uh, I, again, what are your hopes for China and how relevant, you know, does China still have the same capacity to shift your risk sentiment as it did in historical times over, let's say, over the past five years? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes to China, it's certainly been a disappointing path over the course um, of the last year when it comes to that um, economic reopening story. Um, and so I think, you know, it probably continues to look a little bit more difficult until we have, you know, further confirmation that policymakers are able to put a floor under the housing sector. But I do think that this cycle looks different um, than, pa than past ones that, you know, we we've seen with China. This, this economic recovery is, is not housing-led um, because policy Makers are concerned with exacerbating um, existing you know, debt issues, and so instead they're relying on that um, being led by the consumer. And then when we, I think we expand that out into the rest of the world, um, one thing that we do note is that you know, sales exposure um, from China to the rest of the world it is quite small. It's you know, 1 to 2 percent um, in the U.S. It's, it's higher in the euro area, around 10 percent, which is, I think, why you're seeing more pressure on European markets relative to the U.S. But I would, I think, hesitate to overstate China's impact on the rest of the world when it comes to stock markets. Okay, Madison, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. That is Madison Fowler of J.P. Morgan Private Bank. All right, let's get a quick check on your markets as we head to the break. S&P 500 futures trying, attempting to put in some gains, and you got it up a tenth of one percent. Dollar little changed as the yen dives versus the euro and the dollar. Ten-year yields, those coming in by about six basis points as crude climbs to near $83 a barrel. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Manus Cranny in New York. Manus, we've had a whole lot of earnings out of Europe. Worth just going through some of them. BP yep. falling this morning. Yes, their third quarter profit rebounded, but the weakness was in their gas trading. Are you Budweiser or Stella Artois? That's the question you need to ask yourself for AB InBev. Mm. Here in the U.S., of course, Bud Light fell 13.5% amid the pushback on the marketing campaign with transgender influencer, Danny. So uh, the stock will be one to watch. I drink neither of those things. Anyway, BASF, sluggish German economy, high energy costs weighed on earnings, but still able to climb about 4% this morning. And then Stellantis absorbing a $3 billion strike impact uh, with uh, higher revenues. So uh, those are the stocks to watch on the board today. 
All right, let's get more into this earnings season. Tim Craighead of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now. And Tim, every quarter publishes a great scorecard for earnings. Tim, what's the scorecard telling us? How do we judge this quarter so far? Yeah, I, I tell you, it is a real mixed bag. And it's cliche but it but it's true. At this point, we've got uh, about 45% of the European market cap having reported earnings that does report earnings in a quarterly basis. And at this point, you think on the surface it's okay, 50% or so beat, 35% um, or so miss. Uh, but this is the worst record from that perspective that we've seen since the pandemic lows back in 2020. Um, quite typically, companies play that a little bit better. Um, within that context, um, you've got a real variety of reactions. You just talked about a miss with a positive mm -hmm. reaction, uh, a beat with a negative reaction. Uh, that's across the board this time. Um, it's really a bit willy-nilly to be less technical. I think two sectors to pay attention to from that, from that vantage point. One is energy. Um, notwithstanding BP today, uh, there have been some misses given the nature of where we're at with energy prices down from last year. But the stocks have reacted generally positive because energy prices are up from the lows of a couple of few months ago. So take your pick. Financials are the real, uh, I think, uh, key point mm. where we've ridden this wave of net interest margin mm -hmm. expansion. Um, if companies have come in and been OK, the stocks might react a little positive. but. God forbid they miss or there's a crack in that interest mar in that net interest margin story. And the stocks have been punished. Um, our analysts have a, a, a negative focus idea on the European banks saw, looking into next year because of that. Yeah, and we, we saw some some brutal uh, punishing of stocks last week where their top line, especially in tech, where their, their top line profits were grand. But uh, within within the cloud business, for example, um, it, it, it was you know, really, really aggressively pushed back. Um, RBC said it's the most pessimistic tone on post-earnings conference call. That's perhaps the most striking, which takes us back then to labor costs are rising. Um, we have high interest rates. So what is the, what's the impact on margins and profitability? Will that, have we any more light on that, Tim? Yeah, it's really interesting, Manus. This has been the biggest concern that we've had um, coming into the earnings reporting period for some of those factors that you've discussed. In fact, on the surface, margins have been pretty resilient. Top line has missed a little bit. Margins have held up, which has actually you know, kept that earnings performance okay. How, however, um, if you dig into some of the details, um, we've got... Um, some concerns when it comes to, as you said, rising um, uh, uh, labor costs. With that, companies have really taken a, an aggressive stance on restructuring, uh, which I think is part of the margin resilience story. Uh, we've had 17 companies in October announce layoffs of about 26,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, in the prior three quarters, it's been 19 companies per quarter with a little over 20,000 headcount reductions. Mm. So much more aggressive right now on trying to protect the margin. Right. We also had some China data this morning, uh, another morning, another weak set of data. This time it was factory orders. I know you and the team have done a lot of work on how much of the China weakness actually ends up filtering down to European earnings. What did you find in terms of that exposure? Yeah, so going into earnings, we had done some analysis. You know, there's 80 companies that have got substantive exposure across the stock 600. It adds to about 450 billion in revenue. Uh, you know, and these these are big companies. It's over 30 percent of the market cap of the stock 600. So it matters. Um, what we're seeing right now, I'd say, is certainly skewed to the negative. Um, we've seen. The auto companies all have issues from the standpoint of competitive pressures, um, pricing concerns. Uh, we've seen some of the luxury goods companies have softness in China. The reopening story uh, just hasn't fallen, uh, come through. Um, that said, there's been some positive surprises as well. Atlas Copco has been good in the vacuum business, which feeds into semiconductors. Mm -hmm. um, you've got uh, Hermes that's been better than, say, LVMH. Right. Um, so go figure that one out. Um, so I, I do think that's because that's because Danny's actually been buying her. That's actually because she's got the order in for the for, for the Bir <laughs> for the Birkin bag, and she sent me down to Dior, and she said, "Can you make sure pay. you come back with the Dior?" <laughs> 
Birkenstocks. I said, what kind of wages do you think they're paying me here with the rent? But you've, you've got a spooky treat. You've got a spooky treat for us, haven't you? Go on, show us your Halloween costume. I, I, I'm dying to know what yeah, you're going to wear. Wanna, there we I'm go. I'm still deciding for I tonight. I want to know how Tim. I want to know how Tim has been able to see us this whole time without wearing his proper glasses. He's, he's only just put them on. This is the true Tim Craighead, Manus. <laughs> it's, it's a spooky Ooh. brief. <laughs> you know, he's never let it be said that I'm the mad person on this show. That's all I'm saying. For mental health reasons, I, yeah. There's other people. There's other people with like bigger issues than say, me. I should just say, because we have a radio listening audience too, I should just tell them Tim has pumpkin glasses on right now. They're probably very confused, <laughs> only getting the audio version of this. Tim, thank you very much oh. for joining us. Tim Craighead. <laughs> Pumpkinhead? I don't know. Maybe we change it up for Term this of Halloween season of Bloomberg Intelligence. It really is. All right. Coming up on the program, we're going to take a look at some of the market moving events to watch throughout your spooky day, Manus. Danny, let's just check in on the bonds uh, this morning. You've got 10-year government bond yields just coming down ever so slightly. And, of course, we have Mark Darding from Blue Bay saying the Japanese are hoping that another spike in the U.S. bond market will do the job for them. Capping yields around 1%. Bulls drop a little bit lower. Of course, we had North Rhine West Philly yesterday uh, taking the heat out of the bond market. But the Aussie rates rise uh, quite significantly. Will the RBA have to go for another hike? That is the moot in the market. Good morning from New York and London on The Brief. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day with a look at what's ahead. So first up, we have a lot of European eco data coming throughout the day. We'll get Eurozone GDP and CPI at 6 a.m. Eastern time, so very shortly. We're also going to get ECB remarks from Governing Council's Matty Smoller, Joachim Nagel, and Vice President Louis de Guindos. And finally, a check on, uh, we're going to have a lot of earnings on deck. Caterpillar, Pfizer, JetBlue, Marathon, Petroleum, all open before the market. And Manus, we'll talk more about Japan in just a moment. But in a couple of minutes at 6 a.m. Eastern, we're also going to get Japan's Ministry of Finance. They'll release their data that will tell us whether or not they intervened in this FX market in the past few weeks. So we've had two, well, we've had one call. We've had two old buddies in this market, which is Mark Dieting at Blue Bay, uh, talking about perhaps the market will punch through uh, and test 160. You're probably going to see a bigger manifestation of testing the metal of the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of mm. Finance in the FX market than you are in the JGB market. Martin Malone is still at oral. He's still banging that 200, 200 to the yen drum. But perhaps the biggest thing uh, of all is the euro yen breaking through levels that we haven't seen, breaking through, I think it's 160. And we last saw that back yeah. in 2008. So the FX market is where it's going to get, I think, a lot friskier and more quickly rather than the bond market. Yeah, it, it, it's this question, again, is the BOJ trying to have its cake and eat it too? I mean, I've said this Kit Juke said this to us a couple weeks ago. I think I've said it maybe every day since then. But, but it is this question of can they have the flexibility they want and not face this pressure on the yen? Can they have this flexibility and not have to spend a lot of money if there's a global bond market sell-off? Mark Dowding told us that the BOJ is probably pinning their hopes that you don't have pressure coming from the Treasury market. Don't forget. They've already got 60%, 60%, I think, of the JGB market. If you go back on to July 28th, the currency moved by 7 tenths of 1%. Sorry, we've moved this morning by 8 tenths of 1%. On July 28th, when they last moved, dollar yen moved by over 1.2%. Quick snapshot of what we've got coming up. We've got the Pfizer CEO a little bit later on today. That's at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. That is going to be a, a cracking interview to tune into Albert Bourla. Yeah, because uh, we'll have Pfizer earnings and we also will have Caterpillar earnings. Too long considered a bellwether for manufacturing and industrials. How will it hold up? That's it for Manus and me. Surveillance up ahead. <laughs> 